thank you sir thank you sir uh, so uh, my dear participants and uh, my dear loving students and the, all the faculty members and the, all the pro professionals in the connection of the webinar series today we have the uh, again uh, the webinar uh, on the topic of uh, just a minute just a minute uh, so we have the topic of uh, webinar on the how to write a good uh, research paper. So uh, for this webinar, is we have the stalwarts and the well-known uh, researcher and the well-known personality with us, um, Professor Raghuveer Singh Chaudhary is the Vice Chancellor of the Tirthankar Mahavir University, Moradabad, UP. He is a postgraduate in the management from the Jimnalal Bajaj Institute of the Management, University of Mumbai, and the doctorate from the University of Rajasthan, Jaipur. He has been in the management education for the last 27 years. Some of the prominent institutes where he has the served the senior position of the director of business school, Manipal University, Jaipur, had a management group, Bates Pilani, founded principal and Modi Institute of Management, Lakshmangar, director, University of Petroleum and Energy Studies, the Gurgaon campus, director, IILM, Jaipur, director, and the executive secretary. Indian Society of the Technical Education, Delhi and Director, JK Business School, Gurgaon. His areas of the interest are the strategic management, international business management, research methodology, business environment, and human resource management. He is a trainer for excellence in the soft skills, has the conducted the numerous workshops for, for the corporates like the Parley Biscuit Limited, Nimrana, and Badurgarh, and the Department of the Atomic Energy, Mumbai. Novel uh, uh, Docs Mumbai and RACB Jaipur, IOCL Mumbai Assam, Oil at Dubai and the Lensco Power, Gurgaon and NADPL Nagpur and many others. The topic of the interest is the motivation, interpersonal relationship and the leadership, interpersonal communication, mentoring, understanding self and the other personal effect effectiveness, optimism and the conflict management, communication strategic uh, roadmap and the uh, decision making. He has been the conducted workshop on the research methodology case teaching uh, strategies for the excellence in the higher education through the OBE assures of the learning and the academic auditing, change management, higher education and ecosystem, and the innovative pedagogical tools and the learner centric learning to the academic leadership, curriculum design, and the assignment strategy at national level for the last many years for the faculty members and uh, academic leaders. Dr. Singh has the published the book and research paper in the national and international journals and uh, presented paper and the chair the technical sessions in many, many national and international conferences. He has the delivered the numerous guest invited lecture and the different institute and uh, the research okay. program sponsors. Dr. Rao, that's good enough. Yes, yes. yes. This is the last, last, last paragraph of your introduction, sir. And uh, this is my privilege and it's my pleasure to introduce you, sir. And uh, I want to catch this opportunity. He has the, the experience in the academic administration liaison and the higher education body, the setting up new campuses, turnout on the ATIs, the moving institutes to the higher orbit and the development is strong academic and the administration team, developing academic and the administration process. And the system sees the train the Achieve the excellence in the higher education and ISB Hyderabad international uh, accreditation the system by the international accreditation agencies and the case teaching methods IMA SPGIMR Mumbai. He is life member of the professional bodies the like AIMA ISTD and the IST and AIMS International. Dr. Singh is the recipient of the top director of the leading business school in India in 2012, awarded by the uh, competition success review CSR New Delhi. So we welcome to you. Sir, and we welcome you, sir, on behalf of the Paral University, on behalf of the Paral University Management, on behalf of the Paral University Family, and on behalf of the our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, Honorable President, sir, and Honorable Registrar, sir. We welcome to you, sir. We welcome you, sir, on this PU webinar platform and request you, sir, and like to us and enlighten to the participation participants on this today's webinar topic, Thank how you. to write the research paper. So now I over to you, sir, for uh, this presentation. So now I request you please and like to us. Please and like to us. Thank you, Dr. Again, again, welcome. Thanks so sir. much for uh, giving me this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Voice is not clear. No, yes, coming, coming, sir. Please start, start your presentation. No problem methods uh, simply because uh, writing a res research paper in fact requires selecting research methods i mean there need to be a lot of decisions 
hello are you able to hear me yes sir we are able to hear you sir we hello. are able to hear you yes sir we are able to hear you we are able to hear you sir hello hello yes sir we are able to hear you please continue Dr. Rawat. yes sir we are able to hear you please continue please continue are you able to hear me yes sir yes sir yes sir yes sir okay okay if whenever you are not able to hear me please call me yes sir yes sir yes sir no yeah yes. your yes. voice is okay. Okay, okay, fair enough fair enough okay. uh, when you look at you know writing a research papers the most important most important thing is using scientific methods that is <coughs> Sir, not able to hear you, sir. Yes, please share okay. your presentation. Okay. Hello, is it visible now? Uh, maybe it will take time, sir. Uh, maybe it in process. Let's wait, sir. Uh, sir, please go and present now and uh, share the screen. So, uh, turn on captions. Present now, okay? Yeah. Uh, now is it visible? Uh, yes, sir. Please click. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Go on presentation mode, sir. Yes. Now. Yes, it is visible, sir. It is. Visible. Hello. Yes, it is visible. It is visible My sir. voice is heard. Yes, sir. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah, you. 
wherever you 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 have a, a convenience, there are going to be technical problems. <clears throat> All right, I'm sorry for the break. All right. So let's start with I said, uh, you know, where does the problems of writing a good paper begins? I said it begins with the beginning itself. That is starting with uh, you know the kind of words you are going to use, the statements which you are going to use, the title which you are going to freeze. And the issue is, when should I freeze my title? Should I freeze this before uh, completing my research or should I freeze it after completing my research? I said, you got a numerous such questions to raise in your uh, uh, you know, research, numerous questions. And when you answer these questions logically and scientifically, you will get an answers. Okay. And that's what we are going to see today that how to find answers to numerous. If you don't learn to raise questions in your research, you will never ever be able to make a good paper. Okay. So let's start with, where do I begin my work? I said, you begin your work from very broad issues. I know your broad issues could be your own area of interest. Like for example, if you're a marketing person or you are into this field of journalism or you are in the field of uh, uh, finance or whatever your area of uh, research is, that's going to be a broad uh, areas. And in those broad areas, find your broad issues. Okay, and from there you come to the specific topics that is the theme of your research. From the theme of research, it, it's like a funnel if you look at the shape of what I'm trying to say. And from there, you go to a direct topic, direct relevance to the topic, right? Once you got to direct relevance to the topic, do a literature review around that topic. From the literature review, you keep raising questions, okay? And after raising questions, try and see the gap. You see, when you, when you raise questions, if you find answers in your review, literature review, well, that particular uh, question is of no relevant to your research, unless otherwise you want to do it in a different context. You know, the context could also give an opportunity for identifying a research gap. But if you don't want to give much importance to the context, or that means if a particular you know, question has no much relevance to the context, uh, you could omit, omit that particular question and move to the next questions and likewise identify your research gap. So whatever the research gaps are, that becomes your basis of further research. From the research gap, you draw your research objectives and then you formulate what we call is a problem statement. A lot of us have issues in conducting a literature review. When should we conduct literature review? A lot of colleges or universities have their research committees which demand your research plan first, and then they ask you to do a literature review. I mean, in my mind, that's not the right way because the research plan cannot be developed unless otherwise you have your research uh, objectives identified or your problem statement is in place. So I advise the uh, your listeners that no research plan be ever made without having gone through the literature review. This literature review is going to give you uh, the perfect start to your problem. Majority of us, majority of us, in fact, shoot the research topic. That means we pre did determine a research topic and then around that research topic we develop our literature review from there we try to develop our uh, uh, you know your research problems no that 
that's not the right way of doing your research or doing a good research. The topic can wait. The finalization topic, the words in the topic or statements which you're going to make in a research topic can wait till you get your results where you never know what results would come. And the most important for any topic or to catch the attention of the reader, your topics should come from your results of the study. Because if your results are important or significant, then that must be reflected in your topic. So if you try to have a topic before and then conduct research, I'm sorry, you will not be attractive to the readers and therefore you will not have much citations as well. While writing a topic, you should also be careful that it is not narrowly focused. Especially, never ever highlight a geographical area, name of companies, or even name of the countries in your title of the topic. The moment you say XYG study in India, XYG study in uh, uh, South Gujarat or in Baroda or Ahmedabad or somewhere in say Moradabad, UP, this topic becomes disinterested to the people outside that particular geographical area. Hence, your uh, uh, you know, study would lose its visibility. You will never then get references. So always have a topic which is in a form of a statement highlighting various variables of study as well as the kind of relationship which you are trying to examine through that particular research. That becomes a significant that becomes important and attractive to the reader. I, I repeat what I'm trying to drive home that when you write your title, avoid some of the words because those words have become so clish over a period of time or they have become so redundant. For example, large number of people write the study of in the title. Now, this is an irrelevant topic because whatever you do, it's an old study. So this will make your topic weak, irrelevant words there. Number two, don't reflect in your topic the geographical area or a study uh, in a particular company or in a particular town. Right. or in a particular, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, socio-economic group. Unless otherwise, your, your, you know, research is having a great focus on that particular thing. If your research is on women, fair enough, you highlight it. If your research is on, uh, uh, say, tribal people, well, highlight it. Not otherwise, because then your, your topic becomes very weak. So now let's move on to how important your literature review is. This particular literature is the foundation of your research. If you have done a good literature review, if you have understood how you have curled out your topic, you know, the your problem becomes far easier to handle. There is, there is a saying that if you have a problem at hand and it requires solution in one hour, I suggest that you give about 50 minutes on understanding the problem, reviewing the problem, dissecting the problem, and take 10 minutes to solve the problem. Similarly, if you have to do a research, put an enormous amount of efforts on your literature review because that will give you a complete or perfect understanding of the context as well as 
the, the concepts and the problem itself. And that is where, you know, any good, any good journal would require and it will in fact check whether the researcher has understood the current literature and has he drawn the problem from the on the basis of the literature that means how he has actually curled out the problem unless you do that no good journal would accept your research so that's the significance of a literature review now let's relate to literature review to number of things for example literature review and a research problem the research problem should come from literature review right and the literature gap is then identified from the problems which you have raised and answers if they are there in literature review that is not a research gap if there are no answers that becomes your research gap your literature review actually precedes the hypothesis that means whatever hypothesis you are going to formulate that should come from the literature review a, a hypothesis and a jump cannot uh, form isolation uh, assumption cannot come from nowhere an assumption has to be an informed assumption that means it has to come from a priori knowledge or it has to come from your experience or it has to come from your observations and literature will become the basic document for that assumption hence every hypothesis which you formulate should be indicated from which literature review it has come if you have shown that in your work no reviewer will ever ask a question to you then comes literature review and the result discussion whatever the results you got using your inferential statistics that result has to be discussed in the context of your literature review why because any result which you have got either would be a completely new result which nobody till now has got or your result may be modifying existing knowledge that means you have generated completely new knowledge or you are modifying the new knowledge when you say modifying means certain aspects of a construct have been uh, revisited by you or been revalidated by you others have not been so the modification your result may completely negate the existing uh, theory or existing construct or this may be aligned to the existing knowledge or existing uh, theory. So these are the four important things which your results must be discussed by back by highlighting the literature review. That means which existing knowledge are you negating or which existing knowledge are you confirming or which existing knowledge are you at variance with that means partially agree or partially don't agree and which knowledge is completely new that is your result discussion and literature review unless you have this result discussion a part in your research large number of journals will not entertain you because it means you have not been able to justify your results in the context of current knowledge. Next is literature review is used for index citation and references. When you like write your literature review or in introductory pages, you have to give index citations. 
And then, then that would be again reflected in your references. Your references and in-text citations necessarily has to be dependent on literature review. You cannot have anything in your references or in text citation which you have not reviewed. Please underline that. If anything else you want to include, then don't call it a references. There's a different name to it. Next is literature review and exploratory study. You can do an exploratory study purely on the basis of literature review and publish a conceptual paper. And the last one is majority of your plagiarism comes from literature review. It's a big source of literature. There are only two topics in your either you, you write a research paper or you, you, you write your thesis. They cause most of the plagiarism. Because if you do not give credit to any statement of yours, whatever the statement you're going to write in your introduction or in a literature review, it got to come from somewhere. Hence, you got to give a credit. There will be no source of plagiarism. Another source of plagiarism which could arise to your work is, for example, you have submitted a research paper six months before submission of a uh, thesis or a next paper of yours. Right? Now, when you subjected that research paper to plagiarism test, that has actually gone into the repository. And if you don't remove that, it will get reflected in your current plagiarism report. Or also another source is, if you have not uh, removed from the repository of earlier checked software, that means you submitted your report or a paper to your department or to any other agency and that has gone to repository, then you will have a problem. So unless you remove that from there, your plagiarism can never be removed. So keep that in mind. Let's look at how do we develop a conceptual framework before you start your work. Building a theoretical model based on literature survey. Or let's look at how do you actually build a literature review? Let me, okay, I, this is a framework. That means how do you decide what to review? What kind of literature should I access? For example, I've taken a topic called outcome-based education. And you could see there are a large number of variables in this, learning outcomes, understanding OB, faculty and administrators, practices and implementation, formulating outcomes, program learning outcomes, course learning outcomes, alignment and learning process, review and improvement, attainment target, attainment outcomes, assessment of outcomes, etc., etc. And it could be many more also. Now, these are those some of the variables which actually constitute the construct called OBE, outcome-based education. Now, when you look at the review of the literature, these are those some of the you know, areas or variables around which you will have to identify published source material. And then use the, you know, uh, what you call results or the conclusions of those particular materials. And when you do it, please always use a software so that it will help you at a later stage for the purpose of references, etc. There are softwares available in the market.
Then, after having all done all that, having you know completed your literature review, develop a conceptual framework for easy understanding of yourself and even for the reader. Through this framework, you will get to know what are you doing and all that gets depicted in a form of a picture. So, uh, literature review, I have arrived this, that means you look at OBE consists of multiple variables, PLOs, that is program learning outcome, course learning outcome, the pedagogy, the assessment, you know, it helps in developing a curriculum. It, it, it is part of a vision and stakeholders, okay, and it is a learner centric. And also, uh, another, uh, you know, so, some parents on that particular. So, I want to understand for whom the faculty, where in higher education institutions. That means, does higher education institutions understand the concept of OB and are they applying? Now, when you say understanding, then you can think of, I can add two more here, faculty and the administrators. So by looking at this entire conceptual framework, I can make out what I'm up to. And then this becomes a basis for me to, you know, develop an instrument for data collection. Let's now move to writing a statement of problem. There are number of problems when people actually write statement of problem. I've seen some of the statement of problems written in the question form. Some of are, are written in a lot of negative words. Uh, some of them are written as an advisories. Some of them are written as recommendations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As, as the word says, statement or problem. That means after having conducted your literature review and identified the problems, please put that in a form of a statement. So, where, where do we start and how do we write this? He says. Build your statements around the research gaps you want to study and write clear description of issues. What are those things which has been highlighted through your literature review? Write those descriptions. Never raise questions while writing a statement and do not write negative statements. Use five W's for writing the problem. That is, who is involved in? When does it happen? Where does it happen? What is it? And why it is happening? What is the impact of this? All these things needs to be taken into account while you are preparing to write a statement of problem. So you describe the ideal state of affairs. What is happening? And provide a background context for easy understanding why it was happening. What is happening and why it was happening. Then describe the goals and desired statement of state of the problem. Then say what, what is to be done and what should be there. This is the way of writing a statement of problem. For easy understanding, I have given a couple of examples. Two examples I like to use for you. Let's look at the first one. It's, it's about uh, your outcome-based education it says, in an education system is stuck in outdated methods emphasizing on memory and understanding and lacks higher order thinking or learning. Now, this is the state of affairs. This is the state of affairs of education in India. Then it says, education sector spends resources in terms of money, manpower, efforts, and time, but without well-defined and predetermined outcomes. Again, again, 
the state of affairs. In the Indian context, the understanding and implementation of OB concept among faculty and administration is not at is at nascent stage. OB is a complex concept for the faculty and the educational administrators to understand and implement. Therefore, they would require extensive training. All this has come from the literature review and it has all been put into uh, positive statements. No questions raised anywhere. It is describing the situation currently and what is the status. Second one, <laughs> what and why we need to solve, that is the next uh, part of uh, you know, your statement problem, but I've taken a different pro uh, example now. He says, uh, it, it's all about boarding system in, in an airline. He says the inefficiency of the current boarding system represents a significant financial burden for the company. Why the problem needs to be solved? He says, whatever the current boarding system is, which is inefficient, and it actually brings a lot of financial losses. On an average, then he further describes, on an average, the current boarding system wastes roughly four minutes per boarding station, resulting in a total 20 wasted man hours per day across XYG flights. This leads to a waste roughly to rupees 5 lakhs per day. Now, this is the problem and why the problem has arose is been written here. And then further it says, the boarding protocols used by XZ Airlines should aim to get each flight's passengers aboard the plane quickly and efficiently so that plane can take off as soon as possible. The process of boarding should not only be optimized for time efficiency, but also should be straightforward that it can be easily understood by passengers. This is what is a uh, uh, you know, desired state which you want to have for your problem. Now, whether this state would have or not, this will be examined, this will be proved through an evidence collected by your research. Next comes the scope of the study, very important thing. Why? The scope of study will provide you the focus. It will delimit your research and lay out boundaries and coverage so that you don't go haywire. You don't go get into the areas which are not desired to be there. So here you will define what is to be included in the study. It could be a geographical uh, area. Or it could be uh, uh, some kind of a uh, uh, what you call socio-economic categories of your work. It could be the variables of your work. So variables, geographical area, population, demographic factors, and time period, etc. So all of them actually giving you a focus as well as a boundary and an area of your coverage. And then what concept theories and models you are using, that can also be highlighted. Now, as I said earlier, let's try and avoid writing any geographical or demographic factors in the title. It, it will always be good in that case to write it in operational definition. The operational definition should provide an expansion to your title. That is where you can say your study uh, includes Indian population and these are the various uh, demographic factors. These are the time period which you are used and any other uh, boundaries which you want to lay for your research can be defined in operational definition. This is what is a generally acceptable way of doing things. So the scope of the study depends on what? It actually depends on your title, the objective of the study. So looking at the title, you can always lay out your boundaries to your study. So you, you realize that 
if wherever you need a decision, that means what should you include in your study, please refer to your title and refer to the operational definition. That will determine the scope of the study. From there, we move on to formulating a hypothesis. I'm not going to cover what is an hypothesis, H naught kya hai, H alternate kya hai, how to write them, what is the significance of that. But I want to talk about those things which are not there in the book. And hypothesis should come from identified research gaps and objective of the research. That means getting back to your literature review. This should be based upon, that is hypothesis should be based upon a priori knowledge, experience and discussions with relevant people. So the edge alternate should come from informed assumptions. It should relate to literature review. A lot of people when questioned that how did you write this edge alternate? See, you have three options, not to the edge naught. That is null hypothesis. An H alternate could be larger, smaller, or not equal to. That means it is not what is the phenomena you are describing in your null hypothesis. But how do you take a decision that it is not the same, or it is much more than that, or less, less than that? Which out of the three you need to take? There has to be a scientific way to it. That means it could come directly from your literature review. Somebody somewhere has proved it. For example, you say you, you have uh, uh, to establish that women are more hardworking. Yeah. Women are more hardworking. So you could say, no, they are not. But how do you say they are not? How do you relate it? It should come from literature review. Or whatever you observed in your work area. You must have observed women being more sincere. They've been putting a lot of efforts on their job, you know, and they are very dedicated, etc. So it could come from your observations. So when it comes to uh, showing proof of where did this hypothesis came, you trace back to your a priori knowledge or your experience or your observations. Next important thing, selecting significance level for the study before you start collecting your data. Select significance level of the study. It is decided before data collection process begins and generally set at 0 0.05, that is 5%. Now, two important things a researcher must remember. The chosen level depends upon the field of the study or the situation. 5% is a generally accepted, but depending upon, depending upon the exact situation, the, uh, the you know, importance of the study or the implications of the study, this level can be changed by the researcher depending upon what is going to be the cost of your decision based on type 1 and type 2 errors. Now the listeners must be probably well versed about type 1 and type 2 errors. I will only discuss what happens if you change what happens if you change this level of significance from 5% to 1% or 5% to 10%? That you should be able to realize. That means moment you make it 1%, that means you are saying that out of 100 times 99%, whatever you are saying is right. The range go on increasing. 
because your uh, confidence level becomes 99 percent so when you 99 percent confidence basis goes to at the you know delta of the three almost three so your decision area becomes much larger hence there is a possibility of accepting a null hypothesis uh, sorry uh, uh, you know uh, wrong hypothesis a hypothesis which is wrong similarly if you make your significance level as small one that is a larger one that is 10 percent that means your range shrinks when your range shrinks even if your hypothesis is true you might reject now it's not just a question of rejecting a hypothesis which is true or accepting a hypothesis which is false what is important is what are going to the implications of such an hypothesis it may be it may be okay uh, in the in the you know in the field of academics it may not matter much but what happens in the real life take a instance where you know a, a city in some part is having a problem of reported few cases of diarrhea and the doctors might assume that this is because of the contaminated water in a particular area of the city now to prove or disprove that assumption you will collect certain samples and based upon that sample you have to make a conclusion so when you make a conclusion you got to accept or commit a certain error you might say it is one percent or you might say it is point one percent or you might say ten percent if you say it is ten percent and you say that your uh, your edge alternate is that uh, the water is contaminated in that particular path since you have shrank the boundary you might reject that hypothesis when you reject that hypothesis of yours imagine the cost if you reject it that means you will not take any decision not taking a decision would amount to a situation where the diarrhea might become a pandemic it, it might spread in the entire city but accepting that hypothesis might result to a financial uh, cost that is you know changing the pipeline or is uh, changing certain uh, machines etc to clean the water so you got to decide which cost is important for you whether the spread of the disease in the city is more costly or it is the financial cost of replacing certain pipes or machinery so based upon that you take a decision what should be your significance level now let's move to the research design before starting your work you got to have a design in mind and the research design would actually come from your research problem as you try to say how are you going to solve your research problem that means based upon your research your hypothesis and your topic you are going to determine in advance various tools of research various tools of research you're going to say how many variables i'm going to have what is the kind of relationship I, am i examining in them and uh, where would i conduct my research what would be my sample size how would i select my samples 
and what would be my instrument for collecting data? Are my instruments valid or reliable? Then after collecting the data, I'm going to test uh, the veracity of the data. That is whether my data are fit for analysis or not. I'm going to test them. And then I'm going to select my statistical tools, both, uh, you know, inferential tools, as well as, you know, calculating your averages and standard deviations, et cetera. So there are you know, things called types and number of variables. You could see large number of variables. You would come across the literature, independent, dependent variable, categorical, dichotomous, continuous, discrete, integers, extraneous, controlled, manifest, latent, dummy, endogenous, exogenous, response, predicted, explanatory, predictor, moderating. All these variables, depending upon the nature of the problem, these types of variables you will come across and the type of design which you have. So your design, in fact, decides how are you going to proceed with your research. If your design is not sound, I'm not sure whether your data collected uh, would be uh, suitable for analysis. I'm not very sure about it because uh, your design would be looked through the lens of the reviewer that whether the design which you have used fits the problem. If it does not, then whatever you did beyond the research design is not significant at all. Hence, be very careful while determining your research design. Then you want to look at relationship among variables. You have two or more variables. Are you looking for some kind of association between variables? Are you looking for interrelationship of variables? Are you looking for cause and effect relationship? Or what kind of relationship are you looking? So there will be different types of researchers depending upon how are you going to look at your variable. You know? Starting right from post factor to experimental case study to statistical study, cross sectional to longitudinal, conceptual versus empirical, basic versus applied, survey versus analytical, field versus laboratory versus simulation. These are the different types of uh, uh, you know researches which will emerge depending upon how do you actually examine relationship your of your variable that how many variables and what relationship are you going to examine. Just give one example, say post-factor research and experimental research. You know, experimental research happens when the researcher manipulates independent variable. That means he himself changes the independent variable and see its impact on the dependent variable. Post-factor research is reporting the existing facts. That means what has happened is reported in terms of dependent and independent variable. Explaining it through much better an example, say you might say, okay, a student who puts in more efforts actually uh, performs better in the examination. Now this problem, or your, this hypothesis of yours can be examined through two ways. One is, you can take a data, survey data, from the students who already have uh, uh, passed certain examinations and ask them what was their result and how many hours they used to study. Based upon result and examination do a correlation, you will find, is there any relationship between efforts and their results? Another one is you, you, you take an existing batch of students in your university or college, form two different batches, give them two different hours of study, 
and then finally take their examination. You can have a pre-post and find out whether there is a relationship between the two. This is one of the examples. <clears throat> Similarly, say for example, survey study and analytical study. Analytical study is always on the existing data, that is secondary data. Survey actually brings you the primary data. Cross-sectional and longitudinal. Longitudinal studies over a period of time. Cross-sectional is for a given period of time. Next, let's design population for research. You've got to define your population. Who are you going to include in your study? Define them. Where would it come from? Depending upon research objectives. What is that you want to know? What is the title? What are the variables and what kind of relationships and scope of your study? You must have already defined in your scope of the study, in your research objectives and the title. The three things together because the title, research objectives and scope are related. They are aligned. So since they are aligned, it will be easy for you to define your population. And this population must be defined in your paper, research paper. Then comes the most important aspect, sample types and size. First, look at sample size. There are so many, you know, uh, views on what is the best sample size and what is the best sample type. Now, the question is, who to listen? You ask 10 people, they will give you 10 different types of answers. As I said earlier, listen everybody but use your own intellectual capability. How? Whenever you arrive, want to arrive at a decision, please use scientific method logic. For a sample size, it gets influenced through at least five different factors. The characteristics of the population and source list size. If your source list is a small, definitely your sample size will be small. Source list is nothing but the population of the study. That is listing of your entire population. This is very important because unless this is available, you can't use probability sampling. Characteristics of this population. If your characteristics of the population is different, that means a lot of segmentation within the population. You will give out a larger sample size. If the population has a lot of subgrouping in it, you know, they, they are subgrouped on the basis of their education, qualification, on the basis of their uh, occupation, on the basis of any other such characteristic. So you're going to have a larger sample size. Then objective of the study. If your objective study is more of an exploratory, you need to have a small sample size. If your objective is to identify a relationship between two variables, the sample size would be much larger. And if your objective is to establish certain constructs or develop a model, then your sample size has to be much larger. Then, if your study is based on probability sampling, that means your source list, and you are using probability sampling, your sample size will be large, smaller compared to a non-probability sampling. Because in order to have the same size of sampling error, for non-probability sampling, you've got to have a 
much larger sample size. And if you are using probability sampling, then use sample size formulas available in the book. Out, can you close that noise coming from the source of the noise? Then comes the statistical test use. There are certain statistical tests which needs a specific sample size. <laughs> If you are using a factual analysis, it says you got to have anything above 500 sample size. If you are using a particular uh, structural equation modeling method, it says it has to be around 800. So sample size also gets influenced by statistical tests which you are using. If you are using a you know non probability sampling, there are certain uh, references available. It says that the sample size would be equivalent to five to 10 times of the number of items on the instrument or on the survey questionnaire. That means the data which you are, the sample questionnaire which you are using for collecting the data, if it has say around 50 items, 50 questions, so the sample size would be anything between 250 upward to 500. Now, when you're selecting that, then you should give the reference of that particular author. And these are references are available in the literature. And above all, follow what we call is CLT and LLN. That is CLT is Central Limit Theorem and Law of Large Numbers. It simply says that if you pick a sample from a large population, large population here means normally distribution pop, distributed population. Normally distributed population, your samples, if it is above 30, is likely to follow the normal distribution characteristics. So that means if you are picking up a sample from a large population which has a characteristics of normality, any sample size above 30 would keep making the sampling distribution towards normal distribution. And that's what exactly you need in order to make estimates. The problem of estimation comes only when your sample distribution is not normal. So large numbers always have a tendency to be normally distributed. So that is how you will defend your sample size. So if you keep these things in your mind, you can always defend whatever sample size you use because this is what we call is using logic and scientific methods. Then comes sampling types. Which sampling type you will use will depend upon what is the type of research and research design. For example, if your research design is experimental, you have no choice but to use probability sampling. If it is a descriptive design, well, you can use non-probability. But the only thing when you use a non-probability, your sample size will have to be much more than probability to maintain sampling error. Now you should know what are the causes of sampling error and what influences sampling error. These are some of the questions which I'm trying to raise. Please find answers. Also, sampling type will depend upon the source list availability. For simplicity, I'm trying to divide types of sampling into two broad categories. One is probability, another is non-probability. A probability sampling can only be used if you have a source list available, that is your sampling frame, whether you have a sampling frame or not. That is, is your entire population has been listed down. Please use probability sampling and then use the formula for arriving at sample size given for probability sampling. 
Then I said the population characteristics. How the population itself is distributed, where does it lie, what type of population it is, will de decide your type of sample. So as I mentioned earlier, if your population has a large number of subgrouping or segments, and if you are using non-probability, then the best method is quota sampling. If you are using probability, then you use stratified sampling. And finally, the objective of the study. If you're trying to explore a phenomena, you, you can have a very small non-probability sampling method. But if you're trying to establish some relationship, the sample size has to be much larger. And if you're trying to establish a model, whether you are trying to validate or you're trying to frame, your sampling size has to be much, much larger. Then comes your data collection method. Which data collection method should we use? It depends upon what are you measuring. You know, we could measure different things. For example, you can measure intentions, attitudes, feelings, perceptions, motives, etc. Or you can measure the behavior or actions of the people, activities which they undertake, conditions in which they are working, or the conditions in which a variable exists, the output, the procedure, or an events happening, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you are measuring intentions, attitude, and feelings, etc., use interrogation method. That is a survey method. If you are observing a behavior that is something happening, an activity, condition, output, procedure, use observation method. So when to use which method broadly depends upon what are you measuring. Then comes the data collection instrument. What could be the data collection instrument and how do I use it? Let's look at it. Using existing instrument, yes, you can use it for the purpose of confirming a construct or validating the existing model or a framework. Or you can have minor changes, or you can use a completely designed instrument, building a new theory or a new model. A new model, a new instrument can be used. In both cases, whether you are having a minor changes or use building a new instrument altogether, that instrument has to be tested for its reliability and validity. There are different types of validities and different types of reliability and how to measure them is very important for all of us to understand. Let's look at first reliability. There are four different types of reliabilities. Test results or repeatability, or it is at times called stability reliability. Then you have inter-rater reliability, inter-item consistency, and the construct reliability. And the construct reliability is also at times known as composite reliability, CR, generally. So which one to use for uh, our instrument which we have designed. See, test and retest methods, parallel form methods, split half, they are actually trying to, you know, know over time whether the results will be same or different over time. So reliability used for over time, Internal, sorry, inter-item consistency, that is 
across items and interrater interrater the second one which you see is across different researchers or different evaluators that is when you are evaluating an object say for example if you are evaluating a brand a person or any other object we like to see what is the consistency between or among the raters Huh? Bismillah. 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 Test results. That means we would like to look at whatever the achievement test we have given. Achievement test. So we will find that generally this reliability is not related to an instrument which is used for the purpose of survey. There you use intentions, etc. So let's not discuss this. Interrater, yes, at times if you are trying to evaluate an object or uh, uh, trying to evaluate a brand, you could use it. Then what, what are you trying to assess in this? We, we actually use what we call is uh, uh, you know correlation method to find how does individuals differ from each other. How does in individuals differ from each other? <clears throat> it is basically interclass correlation coefficient is a measure for finding on the inter-rater reliability. Inter-item consistency, most of you are, uh, you know, uh, know that's generally and popularly known as Cron-Batch um, Alpha. That means whether all items on a questionnaire may say the same thing or the same construct. Or how differently a given item is different from the rest of the items. So you, you, you find out through inter-item that is cron batch alpha that how many items on your questionnaire are measuring the same thing. It means it is done through calculating the correlation among all the construct items, which measures the same characteristics. And final one is a construct or a composite reliability. If you look at construct, what is a construct? A construct is a term used to explain or articulate the underlying cause of observable behavior. Underlying cause of observable behavior. Say for example, people donate money to a charity. So you know why they are donating money to the charity. There must be some motive. Which motives drive it? We call it altruism. So altruism is a construct. Now to measure the altruism as a construct, we might use number of statements. And we like to see whether all these statements are defining construct, this construct. If yes, that means we have a high construct or a composite reliability. A reliability value of anything above 0.6 is considered good in case of construct. Uh, yes, same is uh, intra item consistency depending upon a researcher, whether he might take 0.75 as good or 0.6 as a good, but a very high cron batch value 
very high cron batch alpha value of 0.95 and above is not considered good because anything above that will indicate that there is hardly any difference between the items. A cron batch alpha of one will uh, indicate that if there are 10 items in the questionnaire, nine of them are redundant. So higher the cron batch alpha, that is higher means above 0.95, there is an indication that there is hardly any difference in the variables which are measuring a given construct. So that a, a, a value of one individually indicates that the rest of them are redundant. So reliability is all about consistency. Then comes validity. Very important. Validity means is your questionnaire measuring what it purports to measure? So if you are, if you constructed a questionnaire or a question paper for your own course, where you are trying to measure the skills in that particular course, skills, not knowledge. How do you say that your questionnaire will measure the skills? Well, there are two types of internal and external validity can be used here. Internal will be all about construction of the test. And external will be results of the test. Internal type, two types, content and the phase or divergent and convergent. Content in the phase validity means whatever items you have used for that particular test construction, are they relevant to measure that? Say for example, uh, you know, you're trying to measure skill, but your question relates to knowledge. So that means your content validity will come quite low. Now, this content and face validity can be measured through judges. That means you can have around five or three judges from the domain who understand the skills in your own domain. You develop the questions, whatever number you want to develop, share it with them and ask them to rate the importance or relatedness of that question to the given skill. They might rate it from on a scale of one is to five. And you say, hey, if the average rating comes less than seven, I will consider that particular item not relevant to that particular skill. So uh, you get from five people, each item, then based upon the rating of the experts, you get an average value. On a scale, if it is on a scale of five, you say a 3.5 is the minimum which you are going to accept as relevant and less than 3.5, it is irrelevant. So if they give above four, all of them, then definitely it is relevant. Somebody gives five, four, three, two, one, you'll find it is less than 3.5. So if that is the case, then you rewrite that particular statement and send it again to them till you get about 3.5. Somebody might say it is, uh, for me, it is four. Yes, fair enough. Four. So this is how a content or a face validity can be established through user research. Next, divergent and convergent. Here, you are in fact measuring how different the, or what is the difference between each of the item? How different the 
individual items are from each other and how related they are that is convergent and this validity can be measured using factor analysis confirmatory factor analysis there is no other way to measure this uh, validity divergent means see as i also earlier said you know the questions which you put to measure a given construct have to be different and at the same time this would converge towards that particular construct but this would be different so you will have to measure both divergence and versus convergence and this can be only learned through cfa now comes the next one actual the results of the test this is also known as criterion validity results of the test that means whatever test you design and especially this external validity is always used for achievement test this is no use for us if we are conducting a survey method because this is relates to the prediction that means on the basis of the results can you, can you conclude something about uh, a person who has achieved xyz or you could say say for example you could say a student who achieves 80% and above marks uh in an engineering stream would get a better placement so that is a prediction so you can always look at this the marks the students have achieved and placements of that and you can relate it to that that is a predictive that means you are saying that if this happens this will happen you know that is a predictive another one is concurrent see you you have certain standard tests already is available especially related to achievement you know maybe verbal ability uh or maybe iq test mathematical test and so on and so forth there are standard ones you construct your own one and then relate the two that means the score on the standard test and score on your test are they related if they are then your test has a concurrent validity if your test can predict the future performance of it achievement today can predict the future achievements that is a predictive reliability then comes the choice of data which type of data are you going to use you know your four different types of data if you all remember for example ratio data nominal data ordinal data okay now question arises which type of data are you going to use for your research and on what does it depends it depends upon objective of the research a lot of things start depending on objective of the research exploratory research both nominal ordinal data might be okay type of hypothesis how well if your hypothesis is cause and effect it definitely be ratio if it is not you could have ordinal data as well and the type of statistical test for data analysis that's a feed forward we use it which statistical tool would you use for example if your problem is about identifying factors if your problem is about identifying factors of a particular construct definitely you like to use a factor analysis and factor analysis requires a, a definite type of data here you don't have any choice so these three important factors would help you to determine the choice of data then the choice of scale 
The choice of the scale depends on a couple of things. Then first thing is the type of the data needed. Different scales will generate different types of data. Also on the research objectives. Then degree of preference needed. We are looking for uh, uh, only yes and no category. This could dichotomous both or you need a preference on three or five. You know, there are certain situations or certain characteristics which would require more differentiation. And there are some which may not require more differentiation. Uh, 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 you know, differences on three items is good enough. And the number of dimensions under study, how many uh, factors at one time are you studying? Are you studying one at a time that is unidimensional or are you using three, four times? Uh, three more to four dimensions, multi-dimension. For example, you're trying to evaluate a brand at the same time on price, mileage, and maintenance. So in three dimensions are using, so multi-dimensional scaling. And the type of response which you're going to use, is it freewheeling or a structured? That means when you put a question, are you going to give structured responses or you write just, just, just? Let the individual write whatever response he or she writes. So don't have any advantages here. If you're trying to give a free feeling response, you can get a, you know far more emotional uh, responses or far more uh, 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 real responses. Else, uh, if you use a structured one, it'll be easy to analyze, but uh, in-depth responses you may not get. Choice of, yeah, this is most important question choice of statistics. What types of statistics are you going to use for data analysis? Is it going to be descriptive? Descriptive means are you going to only summarize the data? That means trying to find their averages, standard deviation, percentages, or some percentiles, etc., etc. That's just a summarization of data. But if you use this, you cannot, in fact, uh, uh, make any predictions, you cannot even make any estimates if you're using descriptive statistics. Then comes your inferential statistics, that was inferring the parameters. Parameters means on the basis of your statistic, you can make prediction about your population characteristics. That means sam using sample result for predicting population parameters. That is inferring the parameters. So some of the, you know, basic uh, uh, parameters or basic factors which you will use while choosing a statistical test. Most important thing, research objectives. What is that you want to know? You you want to know that uh, how sample represents the population or uh, you want to identify certain factors, or you want to know their, uh, what are those factors which constitute a, a, a good product, or a good brand, or a good service, or are you trying to uh, find out what is the difference between a successful faculty or an unsuccessful faculty? Likewise, there are so many questions in your mind which you want to, get answers, so that will decide your statistical tool broadly. Then the type of data. If your data is normal or ordinal, that is non-parametric, definitely you'll use non-parametric test. If the data is parametric, you will use parametric tests. So that broad category is, that is spatially univariate tests. Then how many, Number of variables at one time and what type of variables are there. If you have a multiple variables, then you use multivariate analysis. If you have only two variables, bivariate analysis. One, of course, univariate. Then how many samples? Two or more, whether they are related or unrelated. For example, if you are using two samples which are related, then you will use paired t-test, for example. I'm just saying one. Then likewise, there are many. Then are data meeting assumptions? Every parametric test requires certain assumptions to be met by the data. Now, if those assumptions are not met, 
you can't use this parametric and which which means which means you don't have to uh, feel dejected that what would i do with this data wherever these assumptions are not met you can always use non parametric tests there are equivalent non parametric tests available and the final one is sample size and distribution that means how large the population so you know sample population and whether it is normally distributed or not normally distributed okay, types of statistical tools univariate bivariate you must have come across test of statistical significance test of goodness of fit measures of association measures of cause and effect test for explaining observed differences test for identifying interdependencies test for theory or model building these are eight different types of test on different parameters you know testing data for fitness of use that is if you are using parametric test please do this these five things first one let's use measures of shape that is look at the data skewness and kurtosis then identify outliers you can use box plot and moser test then homogeneity of variance levin's test or qq plot and finally the normality sapiro wilk and pp plot this is an essential part in your you know when you write your research paper you should tell the reviewer through your writing that your skewness is this kurtosis is this there are no outliers or or if there were outliers through box plot you remove certain outliers and you have checked homogeneity variance for a given a new test requirement and finally you also measure the normality show all of them oh uh, yeah this is some of the examples of research objectives thank you so much it's been almost about one and a half hour i'll be open for the next five to 10 minutes if there are there are ways of asking questions yes uh, thank you thank you very much sir i have the questions from the some participant side uh, sheetal parmar she asking okay. that any kind of the uh, free software is available for the plagiarism check uh, because the tunneting in orkund is available on the price basis and no orkund uh, no, no orkund is free orkund is free okay. it's not it's, it's not uh, payable at all okay it it, it, okay. it checks both hindi and uh, english scripts okay okay yeah okay uh, yeah. sir can you stop your sharing so we can see you uh, can you stop your sharing okay okay yes sir so uh, and uh, we also have the lot of the questions from the participant side but we have the yeah. also limitations of the time from the our technical team side also because uh, yeah. but this is a wonderful session sir and very nice session sir you told about the making of the choice of the topic and the find the broad issues of the and background the theme of the research direct relevance of the topic literature review raise the research question the identify the research gap the problem statement draw the research objective and the research plan the asks about the result and the research also return on the topic and the write the title of the research topic in the different different manner is importance of the literature review you told the justify the result in the current context and the literature review and the research problem research gap hypothesis result directions and the in text the citation references exploratory study source of the plagiarism and you also told about the conceptual framework and the outcome based the education conceptual framework of the study writing a statement of the problem and the scope of the study formulating the hypothesis and the selecting the significance of the level for the study and the research design and the population of the research and you also told about the sample type of the size and the objective of the study and the data collection method the data collection instruments and the reliability validity and the choice of the data choice of the skill choice of the statistics and the choice of the statistical test and the type of the statistical test and uh, testing data for the fitness of the use for the analysis using the parametric test and the research objective and you also caught the various kind of the like example in today's in the wonderful talk and this is your master talk on the how to write a research paper so we uh, heartily thank to you 
you sir thank you very much sir for your wonderful talk and master talk and on regular basis we are also getting the uh, various likes on the our facebook live streaming from the different different part of the country and the students right from the side and the research scholar side and so uh, we are very thankful to you sir and thank you very much sir you are like to us on the thank you yes sir on behalf of the parallel university on behalf of the parallel university family on behalf of the parallel university president sir and the vice chancellor sir and registrar sir uh, we thank you very much to you sir and, we, uh, and tomorrow is the again uh, we will see you on same webinar platform with the next topic if, uh, if, there, are, the, if there are some questions I, to to that, I can take it in first 5 to 10 minutes you can not it okay down. sir definitely sir definitely definitely sir in beginning we start from the question from today so i will okay. not down uh, all the questions and copy pass on the to, pass on to me all those questions i'll have a look at them yes okay. sir definitely i will mail the all the questions to you okay. uh, by yeah. today okay. night i will collect and oh, i will mail you all the questions hmm. and uh, uh, you just uh, give the reply in the beginning Of okay. the application and go for the uh, okay. how to select the good research paper of the good tomorrow webinar topic. So okay. again, thank you very much, sir. I also thank you our technical team, Pew webinar team. They uh, patiently uh, uh, conduct this uh, wonderful webinar. There is no technical glitches from uh, their side, and successfully they conduct this webinar, sir. So we thankful. We also thankful to our faculty members, students. They are they are also uh, participate in webinar. They also arrange the lot of the arrangement in part of the promotion and the circulate the. Things among the students and the various other uh, people uh, in different different part of the company through email and etc. All these things. So uh, I thank to all the persons who are the directly and indirectly uh, 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 attached with this webinar uh, to make this success this webinar. So again, thank you very much, sir. We'll see you tomorrow again on the same Pew webinar platform. And a lot of the thanks, many thanks, many thanks, sir. Thank you. Okay, much, sir. thank you. Bye, 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 bye. Thank you. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you.